This podcast is brought to you by listeners who have become patrons of the show. In this episode, I want to thank Norman Barry, Theresa, Tomas Hosford, Steve Winter, Emily Leach, David Larson, Michael Rick, Andrea Easton Borden, Jim Reichel, Andrew Rogers, Jeff Ford, and Irene, who has been a great supporter of the show over the years. Thanks, folks. I really appreciate your ongoing support. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is Black 47, A World Turned Upside Down. As the title suggests, this episode follows the story of the Great Famine into the year known as Black 47, the worst year of the Great Hunger. To garner insights into what was happening, we will return to the town of Skibbereen in County Cork and look at events there which became internationally famous even attracting visitors from across the world. However, while we will see death rates increasing in West Cork, the famine was also warping pretty much every aspect of Irish society. By Christmas 1846, Ireland had more or less ceased to function with any modicum of normality. It was now a world turned upside down. Some people, at least, began to do things previously unimaginable. This included brutal crimes as starving people needed to survive. To illustrate the depth of this transformation in society, the episode starts in a county not yet featured in the series, County Offaly, known as Kings County in the 1840s. We begin by looking at a man largely forgotten by history, the county coroner James Dillon, and two brutal killings he had to investigate in December 1846. These murders illustrate just how deeply the famine was changing Ireland because, while they are heinous and brutal crimes, the famine had changed Ireland to the point that it's hard not to have some degree of sympathy with the killers. Then, in the second part of the show, we will move on to Skibbereen, where even though we saw terrible starvation in the last episode, things were about to get a whole lot worse in 1847. By December 1846, James Dillon was surely beginning to regret he had ever put himself forward for county coroner in Offaly. Having stood for the position back in 1836, he had won the election easily. While it did offer a certain degree of prestige, not to mention additional money, no one could say it was an easy job. Over the course of what turned out to be a 23-year career, Dillon, as coroner, presided at well over 1,000 inquests. These were investigations to determine the cause of death in cases where people had died in what might be called suspicious circumstances. This work brought James Dillon into contact with the underbelly of Irish society. In 1844 he had been called to the village of Shinrone to examine what was called the helpless and mangled corpse of Thomas Grenville, who had been savagely beaten to death in an attack which left him with several fractures to his skull, a broken jaw and a broken arm. The assailants were the brothers of Grenville's neighbour, Winnie Cahill, who he had gotten pregnant a few years earlier, but he had refused to marry. Disturbing as a case like this was, it was still unusual enough in a country where the murder rate was falling rapidly before the famine. Like everyone across Ireland, though, the onset of the Great Famine in 1845 changed James Dillon's life dramatically. However, it impacted him in a unique way. There was little fear of him starving to death. He was relatively secure. He owned a grocer's shop, was the postmaster in the town of Clara, and was also paid for each inquest he conducted. However, as death rates soared from late 1846 onwards, his workload increased dramatically. A second coroner was eventually drafted in to help in 1847, but by December 1846, James could see the terrible toll famine was taking on Irish society. He of all people knew it was starting to tear at the very sinews of Irish life. People were getting desperate and his work was a clear illustration that desperate people will go to desperate lengths in order to survive. 
While the first 11 months of 1846 had seen just two murders across the entire county, the situation changed dramatically on December the 8th, when there were two more killings on that day alone, and both were pretty brutal. While the killers did not know each other and the cases were ostensibly unrelated, there were strong indications that the two crimes were part of a spiralling crime rate across Ireland which was linked to the extreme hunger beginning to strangle society in Ireland. The days following these two murders proved extremely challenging for James Dillon. Early on the morning of December the 9th he left his home in Clara and travelled 40 kilometres to the town of Burr in the south of the county. There he held an inquest into the death of William Lloyd. Lloyd had been assassinated standing at the door of his house on Church Lane in Burr at 6.30pm the previous evening. He had been approached by a man he, he probably recognised and shot once. Lloyd did not die instantly. Instead, his final minutes became a tragic affair. He was able to whimper, murder, murder, knowing he would not survive, while his family surrounded him. The Freeman's Journal reported that it was a heart-rendering sight to behold six orphans bending over the lifeless body of their beloved parent who, but a short time previously, had left them in the possession of life and health. Two doctors did arrive in the scene, but it was all to no avail. Even though the police were also quick to arrive, they made no arrest, save for the killer's hat, which had fallen off as they made their getaway. When James Dillon carried out the inquest, he unsurprisingly pronounced a death by wilful murder by person or persons unknown. Dillon then presumably remained in the Burr area that night, rather than head for home, because he had a second inquest to carry out the following day at the village of Blue Ball, only 15 kilometres from Burr. There he had to ascertain the cause of death of an elderly man called William Renahan. As he made his way across the county to Blue Ball, Dillon was probably one of the few people thankful for the bitterly cold weather that December. With temperatures in late 1846 languishing well below the average at around 2 degrees Celsius, conditions that made life worse for the starving, Dillon could take comfort in the knowledge that the cold would slow down the decomposition of his next case, the already two-day-old corpse of William Renahan, awaiting him in Blue Ball. On face value, Renahan's death was not dissimilar to that of William Lloyd. It seemed a straightforward case of murder. Although the old man had no bullet wounds, there were horrific burn marks and cuts on his body. However, there was more to this story than a simple murder. Renahan had died the same day as William Lloyd, December the 8th, as a result of an incident that had taken place in his home the previous night. Four men had attacked the house where the elderly man lived with his son Thomas and his daughter-in-law. The first of the four entered with a bayonet attached to a pole, but the son Thomas fought him off. Remarkably then, Thomas Renahan, the son, went on to single-handedly fight off two more attackers who forced their way in and was only overcome by the fourth and final assailant. Demanding money, the four beat the son, Thomas Renahan, until his elderly father, William, emerged from another room, asking were they going to kill his son in front of his eyes. This infuriated one of the attackers, who then turned on the old man, grabbing him by the collar, and threw him into the hearth where a fire was burning. Then, according to the Leinster Journal, the attacker raked out burning embers of the fire with the bayonet and burned the old man. Eventually, the intruders would leave empty-handed without killing the son Thomas Renahan, but having effectively tortured the elderly William, he died the following morning from his wounds and perhaps shock. After hearing this evidence, James Dillon passed another judgment of willful murder. While these two cases were entirely separate and unrelated, I think we can dismiss the notion that two murders taking place in the same week in a county with a low murder rate was just coincidental. Indeed, once we introduce the context of the Great Famine, a common motive does emerge. William Lloyd, who had been shot at his front door in Burr, had been a small-time landlord just over the border in North Tipperary. On the day of his murder, one of his tenants, a man named Watkins, had knocked at the house, looking for him, just 30 minutes before he was assassinated. This was not a coincidence. Lloyd had been embroiled in long-running tensions with his tenants. After they had fallen into rent arrears, he had shown little understanding and demanded payment 
despite having threats issued to him and his own caretaker physically assaulted, Lloyd had gone ahead and seized cattle from the tenants in lieu of rent. Unsurprisingly, given the levels of deprivation and the desperate fears about the future by 1846, this act seems to have pushed his tenants over the edge. They forcibly stopped the sale of the animals, but also seemed to have resolved on a more permanent solution. Acting in the knowledge that a dead man collects no rent, it seems almost certain that it was his tenants who assassinated Lloyd. Fear that he would either take more food from them or perhaps even evict them, which in late 1846 would have pushed them closer and closer to death, was a strong motive. The case of William Renahan was even more straightforward. On the day of the attack, the Renahans had sold sheep at a fair at Ballyboy, just 10 kilometres from the family home. The killers, presumably from the locality and acting with knowledge of Renahan's movements, had attacked the home demanding the proceeds of the sale of the sheep. Events seemed to have gotten out of hand, resulting in the elderly William Renahan's death. Both cases, though, do hint at desperate people doing desperate things to survive. Indeed, as food shortages became increasingly chronic in late 1846, police statistics show similar crimes were increasing sharply across the island. The murder rate had jumped by 25% from 1845 to 1846 and indeed would increase by another 25% in 1847. The same can be said for robberies which increased by no less than 155% between 1845 and 1846. If anything, this symbolised the changes taking hold at the heart of Irish society. People were getting desperate. Indeed, strange as it may sound, and as terrible as the murders were, it is difficult not to understand the killer's actions to some extent. They may well have had starving families at home to feed. For me, I wonder how any of us would react if driven on by terrible hunger and motivated by sufferings of people we cared about. While this might be an indication of just how abnormal Irish society was becoming by late 1846, there was worse yet to come. Murders like these two I've just recounted, or perhaps the riots we saw in the last episode, would give way in many parts of the country to something even worse in 1847, an increasing trend to accept the terrible fate people were being subjected to. As hunger deepened in Black 47, anger and the ability to fight back gave way to listlessness and an acceptance that death was inevitable. This had terrible consequences, as we shall see when we return to Skibbereen next. Now to Skibbereen in the year known as Black 47. Christmas in the 19th century was not the week or two week celebration it is today. The holiday season was far shorter, but it still marked an important religious holiday. However, in 1846, it was an emotional and poignant occasion in Ireland. The Anglo-Celt newspaper in County Cabin, which released an edition on Christmas Day, perhaps captured the emotions best with these words. Christmas has been a time of rejoicing, even to the Irish cottier. It was his season of plenty. With his wife and children collected around his smoking potatoes by his kitchen fire, he celebrated the festival after his own humble but hearty fashion. But visit that cabin today, and how changed the scene. The actors are the same, the man is there, and his wife and his children, and there too the love stronger than death, which ties all those faithful hearts together. But one of the children is fever-struck. The rest are crowding around their mother's knees, who, half-naked, she was obliged to pawn her gown and one of her petticoats to buy meal. They are crying for bread, and she has none to give them, for they are all starving together on Christmas Day. While this is a fictional account, it did reflect an all too common reality for many Irish people at Christmas 1846. Many had little to celebrate after what was now three or four months of really serious starvation. Another journalist who knew this all too well was Jeremiah O'Callaghan, whose articles in the Cork Examiner had been providing a gruelling account of the escalating famine in and around the town of Skibbereen in West Cork. O'Callaghan's words on Christmas in Skibbereen are heartbreaking. Christmas entertainments are forgotten and the purchasing of coffins their only solicitude. 
As O'Callaghan sat down to his own Christmas dinner, the horrors he had witnessed over the previous weeks during his visits to Skibbereen cannot have been far from his mind. Nevertheless, this journalist, who I quoted at length in the last podcast, held out hope for what he would find there in his next visit. In his words, he was anticipating that my visit would record happier and more gratifying details and that at least the miserable wretches then afflicted would be the last victims. On January the 4th, O'Callaghan returned to the beleaguered town and his hopes were quickly dashed. Indeed, the extreme hunger he had witnessed before Christmas was clearly only the first phase of the famine's assault on the population. In his own words, I am astonished and appalled at the alarming increase of disease in the last fortnight, and even with my former experience I could not form the faintest or most indistinct idea of such terrible destitution and ghastly mortality as I have witnessed within the last two nights. That the famine was in fact getting worse was, we now know in retrospect, something inevitable. Although not clear at the time, a set of events had been set in motion over the previous months and thousands were now inevitably going to die. The best explanation for what was taking place, not just in Skibbereen, but across Ireland to varying degrees, is the words of the historian Christine Keneally. This is taken from her excellent book, A Death Dealing Famine. On January the 1st, the Freeman's Journal described the impact of the famine in County Mayo and announced the long-feared crisis of starvation has arrived. At this moment, it was apparent that the various relief measures introduced only a few months earlier had failed to save lives. At the beginning of the year, the government hastily introduced a series of measures to salvage its earlier policies, but they were too late. Many were already irreversibly weakened by months of undernourishment the hunger marches and the food riots that marked the winter of 1846 increasingly gave way to despair, exhaustion and flight. In January 1847, the Cork Examiner journalist Jeremiah O'Callaghan saw first hand of what being irreversibly weakened meant in Skibbereen. I have seen children reduced to skeletons in some instances, in others bloated beyond expression by hideous dropsy and creep around the damp wet floor of their miserable cabins and like meaner brutes of creation unable to stand erect or even articulate. He even encountered people who had gone insane from hunger. In Bridgetown, one of the poorest neighbourhoods of Skibbereen, O'Callaghan visited the house of Mary Sweeney to find that Mrs Sweeney's own mother had been trapped in a makeshift cage. Her daughter had confined the old woman after she had lost her mind from hunger and had become a danger to herself and the others in the house. While any semblance of hope was fading with humanity in Skibbereen, before we continue with the events in the town, it's worth looking at exactly why people were starving. In early 1847, different factions of the British government began to blame each other, a process which revealed why exactly the government's strategy had failed. Clarity emerged after a visit to West Cork by Major Hugh Parker, an inspector for the Board of Works, who was in the area to see how the relief works in the region were going. By this point, this is late 1846 or early 1847, major relief programmes were the main famine relief strategy. The idea, as we have seen in previous shows, was to provide the poor with money so they could then buy food. Anyway, this Colonel Parker was shocked by what he found in West Cork and wrote to his superior, the chairman of the Board of Works, on December the 31st, predicting a very grim future after he visited the town of Skull, which is 24 kilometres to the west of Skibbereen. He predicted a great number of people must inevitably be swept away by starvation and disease. Food is daily becoming scarcer and much dearer. And where are future supplies going to come from? While his assertion that large numbers of people would die was unquestionably true now, the reasons he provided proved controversial. The chairman of the Board of Works forwarded this letter to the Treasury, where the accounts of poverty and starvation shocked Charles Trevelyan. He in turn forwarded the letter to Randolph Routh, the chair of the Relief Commission in Ireland, who is in charge of overseeing the distribution of food to towns in the far west, which included Skull and Skibbereen. The letter and its claims that food was lacking in the southwest outraged Routh, who stated bluntly, the writer is in some error, and he revealed the inherent problems in the entire British strategy. 
His relief commission had in fact set up a government food depot in Skibbereen months earlier and over 100 tonnes of grain and biscuit had been shipped into the town. Routh was able to illustrate the problem in the South West was not really a lack of food. He had opened the Skibbereen depot in early December but despite being surrounded by tens of thousands of starving people only five tonnes of grain were sold in the following three weeks. Routh when he wrote back to Charles Trevelyan in the Treasury, cut to the heart of the matter when he said, food is not lacking, but rather the money to buy it. The implications of this was, as if it were needed, that the famine relief strategy of the British government had failed. The Board of Works had been employing people in and around Skibbereen, and indeed across Ireland, in order to provide the starving with money to buy food, which was sold at market prices. However, this strategy had not worked out for several reasons. In some situations, the payments from the Board of Works were delayed with lethal consequences. For example, an inquest in West Cork passed a verdict of death from starvation due to, and I quote, the gross negligence of the Board of Works in a case of a man who had died after not being paid for two weeks. However, even for those who could work and were paid on time, the entire scheme proved unsuitable as the government refused in any way to control the price of food. The wages of eight pence a day were inadequate in the face of spiralling food prices as could be expected in famine conditions. While eight pence a day might well have fed a family in normal conditions, the price of grain had doubled in the four months between September 1846 and the end of January 1847 and this was what left thousands starving. To make matters worse, the failure of this relief strategy had a deadly ripple effect. It placed all other sources of aid under pressure and they too quickly buckled. By early 1847, the last port of call for the destitute in normal times, the workhouses, which offered the poor a bed and food, were completely overwhelmed, something that those who lived in Skibbereen knew only too well. The workhouse for the southwestern corner of Cork was located in the town and in early 1847 it became what one source called a magnet for misery as those failed by the relief schemes turned up at the door looking for food. The journalist Jeremiah O'Callaghan described a haunting picture of those in need of workhouse aid. Applicants die at the lodge door while soliciting admission. They expire on the roads while staggering towards the workhouse. On the last board day, one poor wretch dropped dead while standing at the gate and another breathed his last a few minutes after his entrance. By mid-January 1847, the workhouse authorities had no option but to close its doors to further admissions due to overcrowding, which had already created abominable conditions inside. In early January, Charles Caulfield, a Protestant rector in the area, had written a harrowing account of the workhouse fever hospital, which was carried in the Nation newspaper on January the 11th. The fever hospital built for 40, now has 126 inmates. I passed through on Wednesday and saw three and four in the same narrow bed, some very ill, some recovering. The plan to feed the starving Irish through soup kitchens, even temporarily, was unquestionably its attacks. The deaths in November were 83, in December to the morning of the 28th, 135, in two months, 218. While the authorities decided to close the doors to further admissions, this did not protect those inside from the fact that society abroad in Ireland was more or less collapsing. The guardians of the workhouse increasingly struggled to provide even the most basic needs of the inmates as they had no money. Theoretically, the workhouse was supposed to be funded by local taxes levied by the wealthier in society. However, in Skibbereen, the poor law system under which this functioned was completely falling apart. By February the 1st, the Skibbereen Relief Committee heard about the fate of the ratepayers, those who were supposedly going to fund the workhouse. Some are in the workhouse, some dead, some have emigrated, others are employed on public works. Basically, the people supposedly going to finance what was the last port of call were now themselves so poor and desperate that they were in need of its help. Of course there were landlords, but getting money from many of them was proving increasingly difficult and this is a topic I will deal with in a later show. In Skibbereen, the workhouse by early 1847 had debts of £1,300 and the guardians had to personally guarantee a loan of £1,000 
just to feed the people in the workhouse. As disease rampaged through the weakened and overcrowded population inside its walls, the situation wasn't helped when the nurse and the apothecary both resigned their posts. For their own personal safety, this was its duty. In Kilkenny Workhouse, another institution overcrowded by early 1847, four staff members died from disease between December 1846 and March 1847. In Skibbereen, the death toll continued to mount. 16 people died on January the 30th alone, with 46 dying that week. As the famine relief programmes failed and the workhouse closed its doors to further admissions, all hope of salvation evaporated by mid-January for thousands living in and around the town. By February 1847, correspondents with the Central Relief Agency in Dublin described Skibbereen as one mass of famine, disease and death. In the midst of this, the funerals which people had desperately tried to continue, given their importance in Irish society, now in many cases ceased to function in any recognisable form. As early as January 1847, Reverend Charles Caulfield detailed how this most basic of rituals for all, whether rich or poor, was no longer performed in any recognisable form. As early as January 1847, Reverend Charles Caulfield had this to say. The mortality is very great among the poor and the aspect of the burial ground is assuming a new form in many cases. The dead are buried without coffins and instances are known where they are not even brought to a burial ground, but interred in the fields. This situation saw the invention that symbolised the degrading and impersonal nature of death during the Great Famine. As coffins proved too expensive for many, corpses were simply wrapped in a calico shroud. They were then put in, and I quote, a coffin with movable sides. This allowed the body to have the appearance of being buried in a coffin, but at the last moment, the movable sides were opened, and the corpse removed, and the coffin reused. By February individual graves were being dispensed with. People became too weak to bury the dead. Two visitors to the town were shown the graveyard where an acre had been dug and bodies were now being buried in a pit. They described the scene. The bodies are daily thrown in, many without a coffin, one over the other. The uppermost only hidden from daylight by a bare three inches of earth the survivors not even knowing the spot where those most dear to them lay sleeping. As hope in any future was becoming an increasingly rare commodity in Skibbereen, the plight of the people continued to gain international fame, or perhaps notoriety is the word, with accounts being published as far away as Adelaide, when the newspaper, The South Australian, carried a story about the town in March 1847. Some international visitors even made their way to Skibbereen, and among them, two aristocratic students, Lord Dufferin and his friend George Boyle, the future Earl of Glasgow, arrived in the town in late February. They captured for posterity the surreal world of Skibbereen in Black 47. The two men, in their twenties, had travelled from Oxford University, bringing with them £50, which had been raised by the students there for famine relief in Ireland. While they originally planned to just travel in the counties surrounding Dublin, on arriving in the capital, a friend informed them of what was happening in West Cork and the two men set off immediately. There, as I say, they captured what life was like in the town during the worst period of the Great Famine. While I do quote some of their words in the next section, their account is one of the texts I will be making a patron's podcast on. That will be available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Leaving Dublin on a Sunday morning, the two aristocrats embarked on what was two and a half days of gruelling travel, eventually reaching Skibbereen on a Tuesday afternoon, where they were greeted by a bleak spectacle. They would later recount, The coach drove into the ill-fated village, which we had come such a distance to see. Almost the first thing we saw on entering the town were nine or ten coffins. Round the end door were crowded numbers of the most wretched beings one had ever beheld, not so much clamouring for arms as looking on in listless inactivity. Skibbereen was now a town of no hope. The listless appearance was that of a people awaiting death. Once arrived, the two aristocrats made their way to the house of Reverend Townsend, who informed them. His expectations for the future were equally despondent. 
August must come before the soil itself could contribute anything to the support of its inhabitants. But even then, little could be expected, for seed time was rapidly passing away, and in all directions the land lay unsown and untilled. The cause of this is quite apparent. The small farmer, upon the annihilation of his only support, unable to cultivate his patch of ground for want of immediate subsistence, is forced to resort to the public works, while many of the larger farmers, the men who make the exports which astonish everyone, and by the sale of their corn, have alone flourished in the midst of the general calamity, are hoarding up their money in the savings bank, withholding his due from the impoverished landlord, in order that they may, on the first opportunity, escape from the famine-stricken island to the unblighted harvests of America. By this stage, late February, disease was raging through Skibbereen, and the horrible famine conditions were no longer just a problem affecting the poor. The Irish economy was more or less imploding. While those who could afford it were trying to escape the country, some who had once lived comfortable lives were slipping down towards the poverty, starvation and disease that were consuming Ireland from the bottom up. The Oxford students recounted this distressing story which they witnessed after entering a house in the area with the Reverend Townsend. The woman answered the inquiries of Reverend Townsend in a weak and desponding voice and from what we could gather there appeared to be several other human beings in different corners of the hovel, but in the darkness we were totally unable to distinguish them. The case is cited not as an instance of extreme destitution, but as proof of the miserable condition to which some have come who were once in flourishing circumstances. For the woman, we were told, was the wife of a respectable tradesman who, but two months before, was carrying on a thriving business. The two visitors from Oxford also saw how the famine was destroying the last vestiges of humanity and dignity that remained to the people. Not only were people dying, but their deaths were humiliating, and they often did things before they died that must have caused them extreme emotional pain. Reverend Townsend pointed out one man in Skibbereen to the two aristocrats relaying this story. Do you see that man? said he, and he pointed to a tall, thin figure whose white face was rendered still more ghastly by the black hair with which it was overgrown. Yes, said we, as our eyes rested on the wretched creature, cowering and crouching against the door. What of him? It's only a week ago since that man dragged the dead body of his father by the heels across the road through all the mud and mire in order that he might fling him into a coffin. What might seem like heartless indifference did not mean the people didn't care any more but rather they lacked the energy to do anything else. The next story in this vein is one of the most horrific accounts I have come across in my research to date, and if you're squeamish, you might want to skip forward 30 seconds. The two aristocrats, Dufferin and Boyle, were told this story. At some distance from Skibbereen, there was a cottage, in which lay a man and his wife, both sick from fever. The woman died, and the husband had just sufficient energy to crawl out and bury her body in his garden. During the night he distinctly heard dogs scratching and howling over what he knew too well was the lately made grave. He sent out his little girl to drive them away, but they only bit at her and frightened her back into the cottage. The following day one of the neighbours brought back the head of the unfortunate woman saying that his dog had brought it home. While it was the conditions in Skibbereen that grabbed international headlines, rural parts of the wider region were arguably even worse off. Contemporaries believed that Bally de Hob and the surrounding area, around 15 kilometres to the west of the town, was the worst affected region in West Cork. The journalist Jeremiah O'Callaghan visited Kilbrenogue on the shores of Roaring Water Bay, which he described as the perfect charnel house, a reference to a building used to store human bones. He predicted in a few weeks all the inhabitants of this graveyard village would disappear. He was tragically correct, as Patrick Hickey, the historian of the famine in West Cork, whose work I have used in making this show, commented on O'Callaghan's prediction that Kilbrenogue would disappear. He was quite correct. The village itself disappeared. It died in the famine and became its own graveyard. With death, misery and suffering ubiquitous, fewer and fewer people thought about the future and less still about creating new life. In this chaotic world turned upside down, the birth rate unsurprisingly, was falling rapidly by early 1847 and it would seem very few were engaging in sexual activity of any kind. 
in the parish of Cahara to the north of Skibreen, baptisms fell from 38 in March 1846 to 26 in March 1847, a decline of 31%. These children, born in March 1847, would have been conceived the previous summer, just when the famine was beginning to take its toll. By the time Lord Dufferin and his friend George Boyle arrived in Skibreen in February 1847, unsurprisingly very few people appeared to have been trying to conceive at all. Nine months after their visit, in October 1848, in the parish of Ahadown, a few miles to the west of Skibreen, there was not a single baptism registered in the parish, and there had only been two over the previous two months. There had been 61 baptisms in the same three months in 1846. While starving women generally don't menstruate, meaning they could not get pregnant, in all reality, many people could no longer walk from hunger, so few had the inclination or energy for sex in the first place. As horrific as the experience of communities in West Cork was, they were not unique. The dynamics of the famine varied from place to place, as I've said in previous shows. In some areas, food itself was lacking, rather than, as in Skibbereen, the money to buy it. But ultimately, the results were still the same. Up and down the West Coast, thousands were suffering terrible deaths. Indeed, in some places, there are accounts that are worse than those I have relayed from West Cork. Some people were living in a world that was more like ghoulish fiction than real life. On January the 20th, 1847, the Belfast Vindicator reported on the final horrific hours of a certain Thomas McManus, who had died in Kilmactrani in County Sligo. Again, if you are squeamish, you may want to skip forward 30 seconds. This was the report of McManus' death. Both the legs as far as the buttocks appeared to have been eaten off by a pig. Death was caused by cold and hunger. There was not a particle of food found in the deceased's stomach or intestines. Those who saw the body were of the opinion, from the agonised expression on McManus's countenance, that he was alive when the pig attacked him. In the face of such horrors and appalling death rates, the British government had little option but to accept their failure and change from their completely and utterly inadequate response. However, by early 1847, the embryo of what would become the third major attempt at famine relief in Ireland was already being put into practice on the ground in some communities. This was soup kitchens. From as early as September 1846, soup kitchens had been providing free or very cheaply cooked meals to the starving poor. One of the first had been opened in Kilco near Skibbereen. Indeed, by late January 1847, there was already a total of 26 in the wider Skibbereen area. However, these were, as one witness described, but as a drop in the ocean. Hundreds are relieved, but thousands still want. However, that said, the soup kitchen model was clearly far more effective than the disastrous system of relief works, which had totally failed. If rolled out on a widespread level and food was made available to all those starving to death, soup kitchens could possibly work. There were two major obstacles, however. Firstly, the government would have to drop their ideological commitment to free trade, which had underpinned their responses to date. There was no doubt if food was distributed cheaply or for free, this would undermine the free market. Secondly, they would need to put in place the administrative apparatus to operate the soup kitchens, which was no mean feat given the time was not on their side. The stakes could not have been higher. In London, an ageing and ill Daniel O'Connell, a man known as the Liberator for his central role in the campaign for Catholic emancipation, stood up in the House of Commons in February 1847 to make his final but impassioned plea to his fellow parliamentarians to save Ireland. He told them, I solemnly call on you to recollect that I predict with sincerest conviction that a quarter of her people will perish unless you come to her relief. O'Connell was not far wrong. If they didn't act, no one knew exactly how many would die. In the next episode, we will travel to Dublin to see what this new British strategy was like and how the famine was playing out in big cities. Then we will visit Ulster and the North East to see how the Great Hunger was affecting one of the wealthiest parts of the island. If you're enjoying the series and want to get those bonus shows of the original texts, become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com 
p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Sloan.